What's going on everybody, Gary with FCP Euro. Welcome back to another DIY video. Today we're gonna to be working on this F30 328i X drive behind us. So what we have here on the bench are all the gaskets you're gonna to need to do an oil filter housing gasket replacement and oil cooler gasket replacement on any N20 or N26 BMW. Of course, this is the infamous gasket that is known to leak. Fortunately on the uh, N20 engines, it's not nearly as big of a problem as it would be on some of the uh, N52, N54, N55 engines. Fortunately, the harmonic balancer design makes it impossible for the belt to get sandwiched between the harmonic balancer and the engine, therefore creating a problem in which the belt is ingested by the engine but we've talked about that in other videos. But oil leaks are never a good thing. You wanna take care of them as soon as possible, particularly at the oil filter housing since there is a pretty large volume of oil there. And since that is a major part of the lubrication system, you really don't want oil just seeping out of your engine for long periods of time. Uh, so what we have here are all the gaskets needed, including the intake manifold gaskets because we do have to sneak the intake manifold gasket off, all the replacement hardware. And of course, because the upper radiator hose travels through the oil filter housing and the oil cooler goes to the oil filter housing and there's a coolant line there, we're gonna have to top off cooling at the end of this job, but we'll show you how to do that. So with that said, let's talk about some of the tools you need to do this job, and then we'll go ahead and get right into it. So some of the tools we're gonna need for this job, 13 millimeter socket, 10 millimeter socket, an 11 millimeter socket, E10, E12, hose picks and other picks are really useful, flathead screwdriver for various things you're gonna find in this video are gonna be useful as well. Uh, these hose clamp drivers, uh, in this case, six, seven and eight millimeters, since we have all three sizes that we're gonna be working with on this car, pliers, a torque wrench that could do 10 to 20 new meters of torque, varying ratchets to different sizes. I'd say the only real special tools you're gonna to want on this job for your oil filter, 86 millimeter 16 flute. And uh, if you have access to a quarter inch E10 swivel socket, that's gonna be useful, as well as an E10 ratcheting wrench. Other than that, an inspection mirror, magnet, a long T30, and various extensions are gonna help you do the job. And uh, for removal of the splash shield, uh, an eight millimeter is also gonna be super useful for that. In this case, I have it on this electric impact, which just makes it go by a little bit faster if you don't need that, but just kind of helps get the job done a little bit quicker. So now we talked about all the tools we're gonna need to do this job. Let's go and get into it and see what we have to do to get this job done. So here's the N20 in all its glory. Actually, this is an N26. Uh, it's a Sulev, but everything else is the same on it. Here's our oil filter housing. Here's the oil cooler, uh, which uses engine coolant. Uh, so when we open the system, coolant's gonna come out to help reduce the complete mess that that's gonna generate. We are gonna drain some coolant from the cooling system at one point, but first, I'm gonna get rid of the uh, air box. This is not necessarily required, but it's gonna open up the engine bay um, to you know, give you a little bit more room to work and see things. Um, so it's not really that much extra work to get this out of here. First, we're going to disconnect our mass airflow sensor. The connector here is uh, upside down, so it does make it a little bit difficult to find the locking mechanism. Next up, we're gonna go ahead and pull this vacuum line from this air tube, it just slides off. Next, I'm gonna loosen up this uh, hose clamp. It's an eight millimeter. Now, uh, sizes are probably gonna vary whether you have an aftermarket intake or not, uh, but I will say this, these uh, flexible hose clamp drivers, super useful for getting hose clamps at awkward angles. Normally I have to go down there with a ratchet and a socket, but uh, these make that super easy. So these are good to have. Next up, we're just gonna pull our air box right out. Just goes past these grommets and it's out. Next up, we're just gonna pull the engine cover off. It just comes right out. And then we're also gonna pull this out of the way as well. This is just, um, acoustic insulation for the engine because you know these N20s are obviously really quiet after all, not really. So this is just to quiet down the injection and lifter noise that these engines are known for. So at this point we have everything exposed that we need to have exposed in order to uh, gain access to the oil filter housing. Uh, but one thing to note, if you've ever done an oil filter housing gasket in like an N54, N55, you know that the intake manifold is 100% in the way of the uh, rearward oil filter housing bolt. Uh, if you've never done an M52, you know that you can get to that bolt with a swivel. But what they did on the N20 is they did a hybrid of that. So you can see the bolt down in there, uh, but the intake manifold is still completely in the way. So it's like they almost gave you some hope, but unfortunately on these engines, you do have to pull the intake manifold realistically to uh, gain access to that bolt. Obviously your ECU is right on top of the intake manifold. 
uh, and that ECU also blocks some of the uh, mounting screws or nuts for the intake manifold itself. So we're gonna have to pull the ECU. We're gonna have to pull our intake charge pipe here. So best thing you can do, since we're gonna have to disconnect the ECU, is to remove the battery ground in the trunk. Therefore, that neutralizes the vehicle's electrical system and you don't risk shorting anything out. The last thing you'd ever wanna do is have to replace one of these because you made a boo-boo or shorted something out. So we're gonna go to the trunk and disconnect the battery ground. So after removing the access panel to the battery, which is always gonna be in the rear right on these cars, we use a 10 millimeter socket to loosen our uh, battery ground terminal here. And then once it's loose, we'll just pull it off. And we'll just go ahead and push the battery ground off to the side so that it can't possibly come into contact with the battery while we're doing other work. So at this point, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start removing some of these connectors for the DME. Uh, like I said, to get access to all of our uh, mounting nuts for the intake manifold in order to pull this thing back to give us some room, um, you have to remove the DME out of place. So these connectors just simply pop off like so. These forward ones, just depress the tab, pull the lock down, past the lock, and then the connector just ejects itself, which is pretty convenient. I'm gonna pull this connector out. This one's a little tricky because this one's a sliding lock. BMW's been using these for pretty much forever. So you wanna make sure that you pull on it evenly and as you pull it out, it's gonna pull the connector up. So you can kind of see how that's ramped like so. And then lastly, we have these two connectors here, which simply have the locking tabs on them on the side. So we're gonna squeeze those and pull up. I just use these uh, hose, hose pliers to um, keep those tabs pinched. For whatever reason, the locking mechanism on this rear one was just being a little, a little finicky. So these can help when you have those tabbed connectors on there. Then uh, we have our, uh, it's just another pressure sensor here that I'm going to remove. At this point, I'm really just going to try to drape most of these connectors out of the way. I've got four T30 screws that hold the DME to the intake manifold, sort of mounts to this base here. Now we can go ahead and just slide our DME out of the way, put this someplace safe. Uh, but this basically is a big old heat sink. So as air is being pulled in the engine, it's passing past the heat sink. It's pulling heat out of this, which therefore is cooling this. So I think well, one thing to know in this car is obviously some aftermarket stuff, uh, the charge pipe, but this also has one of these, um, you know, inline signal modifying devices, which, you know, artificially uh, decreases the boost being read via the map sensor. So basically the car over boost and makes more power. Pretty common. Uh, normally you'd have a wiring lead that just plugs directly into this map sensor here, but as you can see, it uh, sort of just bypasses and does all this crazy stuff. Uh, we do have to remove our charge pipe here. So I'm gonna start by disconnecting some of these connectors. So this car has an aftermarket intercooler and an aftermarket uh, aluminum charge pipe. So none of these connections here share anything with the factory setup. Factory setup is more traditional with uh, these lock style fittings. So for us, it's gonna just be a 10 millimeter socket to loosen up this hose clamp. Next, we're gonna go ahead and pull this locking ring up before we get the charge pipe out of the way. Go ahead and disconnect this hose here. So I got some room on this charge pipe on that, basically it's the vacuum line. And now we have another one of those right down there at the bottom. There it is. 
Ultimately, because of this aftermarket charge pipe, I decided it was easier to unclip this vacuum line from uh, down there at the inlet pipe and then try to disconnect from here just because this fitting is extra tight and I don't want to break this preformed vacuum line. So just disconnect it from over there. I'll just keep these two pieces together. Once the DME is out of the way, you have one slot here, you have another slot over here. Those are the two nuts that are pretty much obscured. It's five 11 millimeter nuts. You pull the nuts off and then from that point, uh, you know, after you have the charge pipe out of the way, you should be able to remove the intake manifold off the studs far enough to give yourself access to that one rearward bolt on the oil filter housing. In BMW TIS's repair instructions, they want you to physically remove the entire intake manifold, which is basically where we are at this point. However, I'm not going to remove the intake manifold entirely from the engine. What I've done is I removed the five nuts that hold the intake manifold down the cylinder head. I'm leaving the throttle body attached and I'm leaving the fuel tank evap line still connected. And what I should be able to do at this point is pull the intake manifold back far enough to get past the studs. This will open up room to this rearward bolt. It also allow me to replace the intake manifold gaskets and I won't have to worry about removing the entire thing from the engine bay. We're like 75% of the way there, but to save time, why bother the extra 25% if you don't need to do it? So there we go. Intake manifold is off entirely. And that's gonna give me complete access to replacing all the throttle body gaskets and also gives me full access to that E10 Torx at the bottom there. So this is the easier, uh, more efficient way of doing this job. We're gonna use our special oil filter cap socket. It's 86 millimeter, 16 flute. This is from CTA. I'm gonna go ahead and remove our oil filter entirely. There's gonna be oil in the oil filter housing, but we're gonna siphon out um, what's left. Basically the key here is to reduce the mess and the flow of coolant and oil down the engine block after we remove this. Some of this oil will drain back into the engine, but there will be some left over and we're just gonna siphon that out. I'm gonna take our little suction pump here, a little fluid evacuator and suck out this oil. That's fun, look at that. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and remove our expansion tank cap. Uh, obviously, if the vehicle is warm, make sure that when you're removing this, that you do it slowly. If the vehicle is at operating temperature, you really don't wanna do this at all because it could cause the uh, coolant to expand and you'll burn yourself. So ideally, you wanna wait till the engine is cooled down. So there's no pressure in the system. Just gonna leave the cap like that. Uh, if you don't do this, it's gonna take a lot longer for the uh, coolant to drain uh, and to expedite this process rather just have that go quickly. So, so the fact of the matter is um, you do have to drain coolant uh, to prevent making a massive mess. Now you could technically do this inside the engine bay. If you have a small enough container, you can undo one of the lines of the thermostat, uh, but there's still gonna be coolant in the oil cooler. There's still probably gonna be some coolant um, in the upper radiator hose. Uh, and one of the things on this job that you wanna avoid is dumping a whole bunch of coolant into the engine bay, uh, especially with the electric steering rack underneath. So. In my opinion, it's best to drain coolant um, from the inlet of the water pump and try to contain the mess as much as possible. Uh, this is an X-Drive car, so we're also going to remove this reinforcement plate under here, uh, which is held on by 13 millimeters, but this forward splash shield is held on by a bunch of eight millimeter self-tapping screws. I'm using a 60 millimeter uh, hose clamp driver to loosen up this hose clamp. Yeah, this is where it's terrible draining this cooling system. There's no drain plugs. Um, the lowest point is the water pump. So this is really the only way to do it and not make a massive mess. So it's either do this now and have a little bit of cleanup or try to do it from the top and then have a lot of cleanup later. So now that you've deconstructed half of your car and you're six to seven beer deep, now's the time to do the job that you came here for. So with the intake manifold pulled back from the cylinder head, you now have access uh, to that one lowly E10 bolt. So all of the work that you've done up to this point, all of the frustration that you've probably felt and experienced, remember it's all for this one bolt. So this comes your point in the job where you get some satisfaction from what you've done. Uh, it's an E10 I'm using a uh, swivel E10 socket, uh, but you can get on it with a straight one as well. I'm just using a swivel because I have it available. And then, uh, just gonna break it free. 
And the nice thing with uh, these bolts on these oil filter housings is once you break them free, uh, they basically come out by hand. I'm just gonna pull this hose clamp, push it down so that we can actually pull the hose off the oil cooler. So push it down there. From here, oil cooler should be empty since we drained the lowest part of the cooling system. Sure is. Normally if you were to pull this hose, uh, coolant would just be gushing out of this. So I'm gonna push this hose over here out of the way for now. We're gonna pull our lock here on our upper radiator hose. Like so. These could be a little bit of a pain to remove. They are sealed by an O-ring, so you have to kind of work it back and forth, like so. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and uh, pull our entire oil filter housing assembly now. So we have our uh, another E10 up here. Just using this uh, E10 ratcheting wrench. There it is. And then our last bolt is down here. Inconveniently placed for the most part, but with this uh, E10 ratcheting wrench, it makes it a little bit easier. Normally you'd have to remove this flange to have really any success of backing this out. But once it's loose, we'll just unthread the oil filter housing. As I unthread the bolt, it's just pushing the oil filter housing out of the way, which is very convenient. There we go. Now this oil filter housing was only weeping a little bit, not a huge amount. So normally when these things leak, they make a huge mess down the front of the engine. Um, wouldn't really want to call it the timing cover because technically it's not a cover, it's part of the engine block. Um, but we can call it the timing cover, I guess. Uh, yeah, these things will normally just leak down. You can see like this crevice right here. Usually leaks out of this bottom side, works its way down always goes down towards the uh, front of the engine where the harmonic balancer is. But fortunately on the N20, you can see it's a more traditional style harmonic balancer. So if oil were to ever get on the belt, it's not gonna cause the belt to go backwards like it would on the N52, N54, N55. So that's a nice update. If only we could have made that bolt position a little bit better, we wouldn't, we wouldn't we're not gonna go there. So now I have our oil filter housing and our oil cooler off the engine. There's your leak. Like I said, it wasn't really too bad on this engine, but uh, kind of want to get ahead of these things because even though it doesn't look bad for now, it won't be that long until it turns into a major issue. And uh, on these setups where the oil cooler is connected to the oil filter housing or if it's an oil cooler thermostat, uh, you really want to also replace that gasket as well. Uh, so those are hold on by uh, E12 bolts. We're going to break those free here. And uh, we're going to clean the oil cooler and the oil filter housing separately. Also gonna make sure that the oil cooler is still free. There's nothing in there that's preventing flow. This is really just one more step in this process, but it doesn't really take that much more time. And uh, once you put it back together, everything's gonna look nice and clean. And of course, you know, usually where it leaks, it's on the underside, so it's very difficult to see. You just have to kind of keep your eye open for it. Now, when you removed the oil filter housing from the cylinder head, there was some oil that did come out, so might have looked a little bit worse than it was. This is just a light film. And obviously uh, any kind of oil that's on the outside of this housing is gonna attract dust, which likes to adhere. And just generally kind of looks bad. So this oil cooler is very simple. There's an oil inlet and an oil outlet and a coolant inlet and a coolant outlet. So. Basically oil comes in one way, comes out the other way into the oil filter housing. Coolant also comes in and then exits there. Um, so there's two different passages. It's very unlikely for those two passages to ever leak together where you'd see oil and coolant mixing. Um, these are pretty robust, they don't really fail. So yeah, at this point, I'm just gonna do some cleanup, go old brake parts cleaner and a rag.
So at this point, uh, since we've cleaned everything up as best as we could, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and remove the original gasket. This is relatively pliable. It's not bad condition, so it should come out mostly in one piece. Although this one's being a little bit stubborn. So typically what you see with these gaskets is they'll get very hard on the ceiling surface, but the rest of the gasket will remain relatively pliable. This is a little bit of a blend of both. So the ceiling surface is pretty, pretty brittle, pretty firm, uh, but the deeper you go into these recesses where the gasket sits, the softer and more pliable it is. And uh, want to make sure that you get all bits of the gasket out. Sometimes you can get these things out in one piece, sometimes they come out in pieces. It's really just better that you get all little chunks out as much as you can. Here's a new oil filter gasket. Only goes in one way. Pretty, pretty straightforward. No mystery on this one, just push it into place. And uh, what you'll probably notice with the new gasket is it protrudes a lot more than the original one. Uh, on the original one, once it was installed against the cylinder head, it was actually basically flattened out. Um, so since the gasket was in that position for a long period of time, it just stays in that position. It's like um, elastic memory, I guess. Plus once it hardens, it's not like it's gonna be pliable enough to go back to its original shape. And here's our oil cooler seal. Same thing. I'd say those generally uh, don't harden too, too much. Um, and I wouldn't say that they're necessarily a prone leak, but while you have this whole thing apart, why would you ever want to put it back together without replacing these gaskets? So just push our new one into place. Same situation, only goes in one way. And uh, you know you want to make sure that your oil cooler is very clean. There is going to be some witness marks from the previous gasket. You don't have to worry about cleaning that off. That's not going to be a problem. Another thing to mention, uh, depending on whether you have an oil cooler on these housings or an oil cooler thermostat, the mounting bolts are going to be different sizes. So if it's an oil cooler like this one, where the coolant goes directly into it, it's always an M8 by 20 bolt. If it is a oil cooler thermostat, it's going to be an M825. So you want to be aware of those size differences. Many have broken oil filter housings installing the M825 when the M820 is required. You could put the oil cooler and stuff back on the uh, car once the oil filter housing is installed. I'm just doing it off the car. I want to reinstall it as a complete assembly personal preference. I will torque everything once it's back on the vehicle though. Right now I'm just tightening up the mounting bolts to compress that gasket. Here we go. All right, so now that we've assembled the oil filter housing with the new gaskets, we're gonna go back to the car, reinstall oil filter housing. And then comes the fun part of putting it all back together. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and reinstall our oil filter housing. In case you're wondering which bolt goes where, long goes on the top, short goes on the bottom, and the medium goes in the rear. So I want to get this bolt started in the rear. I like to get these started by hand first. About the worst thing you could ever do is cross thread one of these bolts. So just uh, be careful and make sure these bolts get started. The key to doing this job is definitely fiddling with that lower bolt. So you don't want to thread these bolts in too far by hand. You want to give yourself some wiggle room so you can start threading this lower bolt in um, to the point where you can then pull the oil filter housing mostly flush with this bolt and then you can do the other ones. Uh, reason for that is, like I said, this flange is in the way. Uh, even though this has a metal flange on it, um, Normally you'd have a plastic flange on this hose at the cylinder head and those plastic flanges are known to break So if you can avoid removing that just in general as a practice That's going to be kind of preferable. So that one's bottomed out there 
The torque spec on these three oil filter housing bolts to the cylinder head is going to be 22 newton meters. Uh, this one at the bottom, you're not really going to be able to torque, so you're going to want to feel for that. But really the key here is to draw down the oil filter housing to the cylinder head as evenly as possible. Uh, every time you tighten one bolt, another bolt's going to get loose. Uh, because what you're doing is you're compressing the gasket against the cylinder head. And it's the compression of that gasket which creates the seal. So just so want to draw them down evenly. I'll go ahead and torque the top two. That bottom one I'm going to have to feel for. You really want to be careful with this because like I said, you are compressing the gasket. So you probably have to go over them a couple times just to be 100% sure. Like I said, this bottom bolt, I'm going to have to do that by hand. It's really more important that it's torqued evenly. So I'm just going to go over these two at the top one more time. Make sure that the gasket hasn't settled a little bit. There we go. Uh, so the oil cooler has an interesting torque spec. Uh, these are E12 bolts. 18 newton meters plus 20 degrees. Probably comes out to 22 newton meters like the uh, main mounting bolts would. So I don't really know why they chose to go with that, but that's just what it is. If this is 90, if this is 45, 20 is going to be basically right in this area here. And basically what I'm feeling for is for that bolt to get, uh, bolt to really kind of tighten up. Pretty happy with that. That'll work. So just going to replace the oil filter real quick with this job. Could reuse the oil filter, I suppose, but um, I think anytime you open up the uh, oil filter cap, you should just put a new one in. It's not going to hurt anything by doing so. It's really important that you put this O-ring on. These come with the oil filter kits that we sell, uh, but failure to leave that O-ring out is going to result in some oil pressure problems. There have actually been engine failures strictly from that. So uh, whatever you do, make sure that's on there. Lubricate the O-rings and just going to go ahead and thread the cap back on. Torque spec on the cap is 25 newton meters, conveniently placed on the cap. But what I found with these is as you're threading the cap down, once it bottoms out, that's basically 25 newton meters of torque, can't go any further. Every single time. I've done it with both a torque wrench and that way. Once the cap stops, you're there. I'm gonna reinstall our cooler line. So I'm using some uh, antifreeze to lubricate the O-ring inside our upper radiator hose. I'm looking to make sure that the O-ring is still round and not flat. Common problem with these is that O-ring is worn out and it's completely flat and warped. This will leak. Um, happens all the time, especially when people buy new radiators to complain about leaks at the radiator neck. It is always that O-ring in there that's the problem. And uh, while we're up top, I'm just going to go ahead and put this hose clamp back on. Make sure the hose is flush up against the water pump. Now we need to go about uh, exchanging the intake manifold gaskets. So now I got the new intake manifold gaskets in. We're gonna go ahead and line up our intake manifold and slide it back down on the studs. So just pretty much lift up, drop it down. It's that easy. So I'm using this stick magnet to uh, get these nuts back over the stud. My fingers are not small enough to make it in there. So this is the only way. So I got these nuts on the studs. I'm going to start from the center and work my way out. I want to evenly compress those intake manifold gaskets. Torque spec is 15 newton meters. So I'm starting from the inner 
nut and I'm going to work my way out. This is uh, an effort to make sure that those gaskets are evenly compressed. And I will go over these just a couple of times to uh, make sure that everything is snugged up as expected. All right, so we're installing the uh, charge pipe here. This is obviously the cold side pipe that goes to the throttle body. Uh, this aftermarket charge pipe was a little fiddly to install. The factory one's gonna be a little bit easier. Um, being that it's plastic, what it did to help aid installation is I put a little bit of silicone lubricant on the O-ring there to help push it into place, and that did help a lot. I think it also helped in the removal in the future because that O-ring was pretty dry. So even though this is an aftermarket uh, charge pipe, I wanted to make sure that that silicone coupler was evenly positioned between the bottom and the top. Uh, it was really difficult to move the silicone coupler up, so I just used a little silicone spray to provide some lubrication. And now I have it in a position where I'd say a good inch of the silicone coupler is on both sides of that charge pipe since this is a two-piece unit. Uh, normally the factory piece would have like a rubber section here to allow some flexibility between the intercooler and the throttle body. Uh, but this aftermarket design uses that silicone coupler and they can be pretty stiff to move around. So uh, silicone spray is always your friend when dealing with rubber or silicone. So now at this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and tighten these uh, clamps back down. Make sure that these uh, couplers are uh, locking that silicone boot in place. So now we got the uh, charge pipe reinstalled. I'm gonna go ahead and put this uh, vacuum line back onto the inlet for the turbo there. Reconnect our PCV heater connector there. And now we can also start reconnecting some of our electrical connectors we removed earlier. All right, so we're gonna reinstall our DME onto the top of the heat sink here only go on one way and from recollection it sits like that seems right I take these uh, four t30 screws reinstall them uh, these will be torqued to 12 newton meters and I would say that spec is probably pretty important because I would imagine being that this is bolted to the engine there's quite a bit of vibration there so I would not rely on hand tight per se I would use a torque wrench if possible on this newton meters and t30 so at this point we're going to go ahead and reinstall the connectors here so when reinstalling the connectors um, i want to say bmw's made it pretty straightforward um, of course you could mark everything take a picture of what goes where um, but you see right here there's a center keyway and then this one has an off center uh, our centered keyway is going to drop down here on the outside and uh, you know you, you should be able to push it down into the connector and by doing so it'll lock itself uh, this is another four row this is the one that's offset same thing should be able to push the connector down and then it'll just sort of engage and then lastly you have your three row here and this is not keyed but it's also the only one with uh, three rows of pins so we'll go ahead and push that in place. And we'll make sure that the connectors are seated, which they are. We have this connector here, which is um, four rows of four pins, which that pretty much is self-explanatory, only goes in one place, which is right here. And I want to make sure that the tabs that hold these wiring leads in place are also resecured. secured 
And now we have this connector which goes there. And then uh, here's our last wiring lead. And this is the one that has the more traditional locking mechanism. So make sure that is pushed out all the way. And we'll go ahead and push it into place. Bottom it out, push the lock in. Then we have our little wiring harness uh, strap there. And at this point, uh, all the electronics are hooked back up. We're gonna go ahead and reinstall our uh, air box here. There is a sort of an inlet channel over here on the uh, left side. The factory air box would just drop down into place, but uh, this aftermarket box doesn't really quite do that. Plug in the mass airflow sensor. Do that now. We had this vacuum line that ran through here. Came down over here. Put that back on before I forget. And then we're gonna use an eight millimeter uh, hose clamp driver to tighten uh, that hose clamp for the lower boot there. So now we have everything hooked up in the engine bay. Go ahead and put the battery terminal, the ground terminal back on the battery. And uh, you don't need to go crazy with these, just uh, choke up on the ratchet. I'm going right on the head of the ratchet just to limit how much torque I can put into it. But once the nut bottoms out, you're done. So I'm gonna cheat use a vacuum filler to uh, get most of the air out of the system that we opened. These are really handy, especially if you have access to a uh, air compressor. Make life a little bit easier. So I went ahead and pulled the vacuum on the system. Uh, it's been holding vacuum. I actually found some pre-mixed antifreeze here from some other DIYs we've done recently. So I'm gonna start with this and then I'll probably end up using that, uh, what's left, if I need that one liter bottle, we'll use that. Go ahead and just open the valve here and we'll let it rip. So we hooked everything back up in the engine bay, all the connectors, nothing's left over on that end. So did that, vacuum filled the cooling system, but we still wanna bleed the cooling system out. And all of these external water pump cars have that uh, feature built in. It's very simple, you turn the car on into accessory mode, put your heat on full max, fan speed setting low, and then hold the accelerator pedal down for 10 to 12 seconds and the water pump will kick on. Runs for about eight to 10 minutes, but it will fully bleed out the cooling system without having to run the car. So it's a pretty nice proceed. It's a pretty nice uh, feature that's built into these cars. Holding the accelerator pedal down for 10 seconds. And then we'll just let it do its thing until it stops. Just gonna go ahead and top off our uh, expansion tank here to the max line for the cold level. Did drop a little bit as the uh, system bled out. And one thing to keep in mind is, you know, anytime you do any kind of work that involves opening up the cooling system, uh, you know, just keep an eye on that uh, coolant level over the next couple of days. It might fluctuate a little bit, make adjustments as necessary. We'll go ahead and throw the expansion tank cap back on and uh, gonna go ahead and start the car real quick, make sure that uh, everything runs as expected. So now that we know the car runs, and we'll put all the connectors back on properly. Just gonna go ahead and slide the acoustic insulation for the engine back on, because obviously, and I'm just gonna go ahead and reinstall the engine cover. Uh, and really at this point, last thing we gotta do is put all the splash shields underneath and the reinforcement plate, and we're done.
All right, so that's how you go about replacing the oil filter housing gasket and oil cooler seal on an N20 powered BMW. In this case, we're working on this F30. And of course, this F30 did have some aftermarket components on it. So struggling with the charge pipe, things like that are not really gonna be an issue if you have the factory stuff on the car. Um, but as you can see, minus the exception of having to remove the DME and pulling the intake manifold back, uh, it's not too terrible of a job. Fortunately, within these engine bays, there's quite a bit of room because of how small the four cylinder is. Uh, hope you like the trick in regards to just pulling that intake manifold back versus removing the entire thing. Uh, that's definitely gonna save you a bunch of time and also possibly avoid breaking, uh, you know, let's say the vent line or possibly the connector on the throttle body. Uh, so that little trick there, as you saw, makes it go by a little bit faster. Uh, but this is definitely something you can take on yourself. Just follow these steps and you'll save yourself a whole bunch of money if you do this yourself. So I hope you learned some of this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave it in the comment box below. Hit that like button if you like this video and also subscribe. We have a lot more videos on the way. And as always, we'll see you for the next one. Thank you for watching.